The Panthers offense under former offensive coordinator Mike Shula is one of the most complicated things I've ever studied on film. And by that I don't mean it was difficult because the concepts themselves were hard to understand, but rather because I don't know if I've ever seen a run game be so wildly inconsistent across different personnel groupings, styles of play calls, or even downs and distances. Some offenses can call any style of run in any situation and have a reasonable expectation of success, like the Cowboys or the Rams but not the Panthers. Their success in the run game was almost entirely reliant on having a specific personnel grouping, calling a specific style of run, and being in a specific down and distance. And when they met all of those criteria, they were extremely hard to stop. However, if they deviated from that comfort zone in any way, for any reason, they would essentially go backwards. There was no middle ground for this run game. It was either all feast or all famine. And I think what was most frustrating about the Panthers offense when I discovered these patterns is that, that I'm sure that the Panthers themselves figured out the same patterns a long time ago, and yet they never noticeably adjusted their play calling around those tendencies. And here's what I mean by that. Looking at the Panthers' run game just on the surface, they were pretty good statistically. They were top four in the NFL in total rushing yards and of course rushing yards per game. They were top five in first down conversion percentage and top seven in yards per carry at 4.3. Overall, that looks pretty damn effective compared to the rest of the league. However, these surface level stats are extremely misleading because without Cam Newton's contributions on the ground as a scrambler and a playmaker on option runs, their overall run game plummeted to nearly the very bottom of the league. Football Outsiders is one of the few metric-based analytical sites that I really trust, and they have a very key stat called adjusted line yards. In short, this is a metric that shows how many yards an offensive line is able to block for a ball carrier, but without taking into account quarterback runs, which are usually the result of either a pass play breaking down or just pure schematic deception. And when you separate out Cam's effectiveness as a scrambler from the offensive line actually blocking for the likes of Christian McCaffrey and Jonathan Stewart, the problems with the Panthers run game really come to the forefront. Out of 32 teams, Carolina's adjusted line yards ranked 25th at 3.78. For reference, the Patriots ranked first at just over five adjusted line yards per carry. And that makes a lot of sense in context because the Patriots as a whole were still in the top 10 in rushing yards per game. But unlike the Panthers and Cam Newton, virtually none of New England's rushing yards came from Tom Brady. So by measuring the effectiveness of these two run games in their purest forms, meaning designed plays for running backs, we can see that the Carolina offensive line had a ton of issues sustaining their blocks up front, hence the Panthers' overall offensive inconsistency. But here's where it gets even weirder. That top five ranking in first down rushing conversions was not misleading at all. In fact, on short yardage situations, meaning third or fourth down with three yards to go or less, the Panthers averaged 4.22 yards per carry for a 75% conversion rate. That was in the top 10 in the NFL, compared to the Patriots who averaged only 63.6%. That was 18th in the NFL. Even Football Outsiders agrees, ranking Carolina fifth in their power success metric. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, what the hell do these numbers even mean when we take them all into account together? Well, in short, it means that when the Panthers needed to get three yards and move the chains, they were going to get three yards and move the chains. This is an offensive line that is big and strong and can down block like a mother -er. So when you're just putting the ball into Jon Stewart's gut and saying, go run behind the double team, very rarely was he ever going to be stopped. That's why they were so efficient on short yardage. However, if the Panthers line needed to sustain their blocks and open up a lane on the second level to get even more than just those three yards, they struggled a lot. And yes, health did play a factor in that because Ryan Khalil was hurt for most of the season and Trey Turner missed time as well. But even when everyone was healthy and on the field together, they still struggled. Blocks were passed off incorrectly, the guards were out of sync with both Khalil and Larson way too often, and even just from an execution standpoint, everyone was routinely getting beat in their one-on-ones at the point of attack. So while yes, those double teams could generate movement at the line of scrimmage and give the Panthers running backs a tiny little bit of space to work with on short yardage, it was almost never enough space to get past the second level and do something more. That right there was the root of their inconsistency. They were really efficient at one thing and terrible at everything else. What's maybe most unfortunate though, is that in 2018, this huge, huge problem with the run game probably won't go away. And in fact, it might even get worse. Carolina's best offensive lineman by a mile last year was left guard Andrew Norwell, who deservedly was a first team all pro selection for the first time in his young career. 
Norwell left for Jacksonville in free agency this past March, which means the Panthers are going to have to replace him this year with either Amini Silatolu or potentially Tyler Larson or Taylor Moton if they feel like converting either one of them to guard. The loss of Norwell could have massive consequences for the Panthers running backs, especially Christian McCaffrey, because Norwell was the only blocker on that line to consistently give McCaffrey worthwhile lanes to run through. Just taking a peek at McCaffrey's rushing splits over every gap on the line, his runs over the left guard where Norwell lined up were way, way more successful than every other gap at a gigantic 5.48 yards per carry, and that disparity was backed up on tape as well. McCaffrey is not a powerful runner. He's quick, he's fast, he's got good vision, and he's extremely versatile as a receiver, but at 5'11", 205 pounds, he was just not big or strong enough to churn his legs through contact and generate extra yards when the blocking was not perfect for him. So when his offensive line routinely failed him on the second level and these defenders were filling gaps immediately, he was pretty much screwed because he didn't have the power to turn those busted two-yard gains into four-yard gains like you see Zeke Elliott or Todd Gurley or Le'Veon Bell do. That's just honestly not his skill set. But when Andrew Norwell was blocking the hell out of people in front of him and actually giving him space to work, that's when you saw the real Christian McCaffrey. You saw the speed, the vision, the playmaking ability, all of that stuff. Those are the snaps that made you think, okay, this guy might have been worth a top 10 or 15 pick. With Norwell no longer in the building though, and the Panthers no longer having that one reliable lineman they could run behind, that changes everything. In fact, I think the biggest question I struggled with while studying this offense from 2017 was how I would change the system in 2018 to compensate for an even worse offensive line. So here's what I came up with and hopefully what I think new offensive coordinator Norv Turner will come up with as well. If your line is struggling to win at the point of attack, it doesn't mean that you can't run the ball, it just means that you have to get more creative with how you run it. In particular, you have to learn to use angles and timing to open lanes rather than raw power or athleticism. That means lots of pin and pull zones, traps, whams, and all manner of runs that prioritize blockers just getting in the way rather than physically dominating their opponent. Maybe the best example of trap runs in action was seven or eight years ago at the height of the Jim Harbaugh era in San Francisco. That Niners offensive line in front of Alex Smith was obviously far better than what Carolina is working with today, but both Harbaugh and offensive coordinator Greg Roman understood that you don't always have to outmuscle defensive linemen out of the way, sometimes you could get them to move themselves out of the way all on their own. In week 6 of the 2011 season, which was Harbaugh's first year with the 49ers, his offense struggled to block a young second-year phenom named Adama Kung Su. After just a few minutes of play, it became very apparent that Sue was going to wreck this game if they didn't scheme around him, so with a minute to go in the first quarter, Roman dialed up a wham play that could punish the trademark aggressiveness of Jim Schwartz's defensive line. Three key blocks and 47 yards later, Frank Orr was brought down at the one-yard line, setting up an easy touchdown two plays later. Pay attention to the angles on this play. You've got left tackle Joe Staley, the center Jonathan Goodwin, and right tackle Anthony Davis all releasing up to the second level without double teaming anyone, while left guard Mike Yapati, right guard Adam Snyder, and the move tight end Delaney Walker all block down with either trap blocks or wham blocks. Vernon Davis, meanwhile, is just turning out this strong side defensive end and keeping him occupied on the edge. Nobody on the offensive line is overpowering anyone, nobody is double teaming, drive blocking, or anything like that. They are simply letting these defensive tackles freely penetrate upfield and then putting their bodies in the way so that they can't get to Gore as he runs past to the second level. Under normal circumstances, you would never ever have Delaney Walker try to block Sue all by himself at the point of attack, but with a wham block where all he has to do is just hit him from the side and be an obstacle, it works beautifully. And because all these free-releasing linemen are able to climb up to the second level immediately to take on these linebackers, Gore has a wide open lane and gets all the way to the third level without anyone even touching him. From there, he just beats the safety in space and rips off a huge gain down to the one. The Niners actually ran this exact same play twice in this game, once in the first quarter like you just saw and once in the third. And all told, between those two plays, they generated 102 yards rushing. On all of Gore's other carries, he only averaged three yards per touch, again because the Niners' offensive line was struggling a bit on that day. But because of Roman's creative use of trap and wham blocks, they were able to mitigate Detroit's advantages in the trenches and still have a really productive day on the ground. 
this is what the Panthers need to emulate in 2018. They need to recognize that if they just try to get into a bar fight at the line of scrimmage each and every week, they will lose. They don't have a lead back that can make up for poor blocking with his own raw power. That's not what Christian McCaffrey is. McCaffrey is great at a lot of things, but moving a pile just isn't one of them. So calling runs that ask him to do that is, quite frankly, not a good idea. And if you sub him out for a back that actually can move a pile like Jonathan Stewart or in 2018 it will be CJ Anderson, then you lose a big part of your passing game and you lose your ability to threaten big plays on the edges. So it's not like those switches come without consequences either. If the Panthers want to keep McCaffrey on the field for all three downs without having to sub in Anderson anytime they run inside the tackles, then they need to tailor their play calling just like Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman used to do in San Francisco. We saw a little bit of what McCaffrey could do last season when Mike Shula actually called trap plays, wham plays, counters, and pin and pull zone plays where the blocks were generated more by angles and timing rather than physical talent up front and most of those runs were very successful. They didn't call them often, but when they did, they worked. So why Shula didn't call more of them, I have no idea. It seemed to me that he was more focused on the option elements of his run game with Cam Newton and all the two back sets that went with him, which again is fine. I have no problem with giving Cam the ball a few times a game just because he's such a gifted runner in space. But what I do have a problem with is giving your quarterback 20 more carries than the running back you just drafted in the top 10 and when you do give the ball to that running back, you call a lot of runs with him that don't actually fit his skill set. That's where Carolina really went wrong last year, in my opinion. They didn't use McCaffrey enough, and when they did use him, they didn't do it in the right way. What worked and what didn't work under Mike Shula were very plain to see. So I'm hopeful that Norv Turner will look at the same trends that I just did, recognize that without Andrew Norwell, those trends will probably get worse, and then make the necessary adjustments to help out both his offensive line and his running backs. All of that being said though, and this is even more important than those run game adjustments, I also hope that Turner is going to change a lot when it comes to the Panthers passing game. In particular, when I was initially charting all of McCaffrey's snaps for this episode, it became very apparent to me that giving him anything less than 6 or 7 catches a game is criminally underutilizing him. I feel like last year's coaching staff missed out on a huge opportunity to take advantage of the best parts of his game. It is not hyperbole to say that on passing downs, Christian McCaffrey is their most dangerous matchup advantage on the field. I don't care if he's being covered by a safety, a linebacker, or even a nickel corner, Norv Turner has got to feed this kid the ball more often on third downs because all he does is move the chains. And I know it's crazy to think that a rookie running back getting 80 catches still feels like he was underused in the pass game because after all that was the fourth highest total ever by a rookie running back. But just looking at what he could do on tape I feel like anything less than 100 catches is a disappointment. He has the short area quickness to roast linebackers underneath, the speed to get behind safeties deep downfield, and the run after catch instincts to break off big yardage on screen passes. He's a very polished and very versatile receiving option, and quite frankly, I don't think that there's anything he can't do in the passing game. However, what I really do think will be the driving force behind McCaffrey hitting 100 catches this year is not just his athleticism or his polish, but rather his chemistry with Cam Newton in pressure situations. When I say that I want Turner to give McCaffrey all of these touches in 2018, I don't just mean that he should design passing plays where McCaffrey is the primary read. He absolutely should do that as well, of course, but really what I'm mostly talking about is Turner giving Cam Newton the freedom at the line of scrimmage to use McCaffrey to defeat blitzes. I want Cam to be able to identify pressures pre-snap and instantly adjust McCaffrey's assignment to beat it, regardless of whatever the called play is. We didn't see that nearly enough last year in the Shula system, which was disappointing because on the snaps where we did see Newton IDing pressure, adjusting his protections, calling out his hots, and communicating with McCaffrey on how he wanted to answer that pressure, they were spectacular together. Newton does not get nearly enough credit for how smart he is or how in command he is when he's allowed to adjust things at the line, but I truly believe that that is where he is at his best. There was an example against the Bucks last season that I think illustrates his intelligence and his chemistry with McCaffrey really well. It's a third and six in the middle of what would eventually become a long touchdown drive, and on first look it seems as though McCaffrey is just running an angle route against Levante David and Cam finds him quickly for an easy first down. But there's a bit more to it than that. 
Before the snap, Cam identifies that it's cover one, meaning man coverage across the board with a single high safety. The Bucks are in a 3-3-5 nickel look, which is three defensive linemen, three linebackers, and five defensive backs. Newton is anticipating that at least two of these linebackers are going to be blitzing, because usually when a team that runs a 4-3 front leaves all of their linebackers on the field on third down, and the DBs are showing cover one, that probably means that at least some of those linebackers are coming on a blitz. Newton doesn't know exactly how many are coming, but it's a reasonable assumption that at least one or two of them are. So you can see him lean into McCaffrey and give him instructions that because the protection is sliding away from him, if Levante David's coming off that edge away from the protection, he's the hot receiver and he needs to turn out to the flat immediately and look for the ball. If David stays in coverage, however, then it's an option route and he'll make the cut either inside or outside based on David's leverage like he always does. After the snap, McCaffrey is releasing while reading David's movement, and as soon as he reads that David is not blitzing off the edge, McCaffrey's got him. He sees that David overcommitted to the flat and turned his hips too far outside, so McCaffrey then bursts inside and Cam finds him for an easy 14 yards over the middle. First down, Carolina. And let's take a look at Newton's post-snap read on the end zone angle as well, because that is just as important as McCaffrey's route. Cam's eyes immediately go to the mic, Quan Alexander, to see if he's blitzing, which he is, and then once he IDs that blitz, he progresses to Levante David to see what he's doing. Again, if he sees David coming off that edge, he'll dump it to McCaffrey uncovered in the flat for an easy first down. If David is not coming on a blitz, however, then he'll be reading his leverage and coverage and throwing it to whatever option McCaffrey takes on his route like he usually does. Either way, he's not worried about the pressure because the mic is getting picked up by Norwell on the slide and protection, and he either finds McCaffrey in the flat or he finds him over the middle and it's a first down either way. You could almost say that as soon as the Bucks gave Newton and McCaffrey this cover one look on third down where he was isolated with a linebacker, this result was inevitable. Whether there was a blitz or not, Cam literally didn't look at any other receiver because he already knew that McCaffrey was going to win, and the only question on the play was what part of the field McCaffrey was going to be on when he got the ball. That's how much trust Cam already had in this kid just eight games into his career, and that chemistry is what I want to see utilized by North Turner more often in 2018. The Panthers' passing game, just like their running game, was extremely inconsistent all of last season. You could blame the injury to Greg Olson, you could blame their offensive line being below average in pass protection, or you could even blame their very underwhelming wide receiving core at the time. But the fact of the matter is that Carolina is not the only team in the NFL that had those issues, and they still struggled mightily at times to overcome them. I think in response to the holes on their roster, Mike Shula tried to make it easier on Cam by doubling down on a run-heavy game plan that used a lot of play action, and almost in a way taking that burden of execution off of him, but to me that was a mistake. In my opinion, they should have put everything on their quarterback's shoulders and basically let him be his own play caller at the line of scrimmage. Newton is a veteran MVP caliber quarterback, but rather than letting Cam get himself into the right play like you see Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers or Drew Brees do, I truly feel that they kept him on a leash last year for no reason at all. There were too many option runs, too many screens, and definitely too many deep bombs to Devin Funches despite the fact that Funches is not even a good deep ball receiver. I know this sounds really weird to most people, but Cam Newton is at his best when he is allowed to play like Tom Brady. Let him spread defenses out, let him fool people on dummy counts and beat blitzes with last second throws to hot receivers, but most of all, let him use Christian McCaffrey like Brady uses his running backs. All of this option stuff on the ground and prioritizing deception over execution, I mean to me all that's done is hold Cam back from what I think he actually is, a very cerebral field general. He is experienced enough and smart enough to be that kind of quarterback. They just have to, for once, let him be that kind of quarterback. Overall, I believe in the Panthers as a football team. They have their problems, sure, but almost every team does. What's important, though, is that enough pieces are there for Carolina to make a serious run at the NFC South in 2018. They have the most dangerous dual-threat quarterback in the league, they have a really good defense anchored by their front seven, and they have a lot of versatile and unique weapons on offense that can be used in a multitude of ways. The only thing that's been missing is having a coaching staff that can call the right plays at the right time to take advantage of what talent they actually do have. It's going to be extremely difficult to win this division in 2018 with both the Saints and Falcons looking like top five teams in the conference. But if I know anything about the NFC South, it's this. Nothing that is ever supposed to happen actually happens.
Predicting what this division does is always a complete shit show every single year, so I'm just not even gonna try. The only thing I can do, or rather the only thing that Panthers fans can do, is hope. Hope that Norv Turner identifies where Mike Shula went wrong, and hope that he makes the necessary changes to correct those mistakes. Because if he does make those changes, there is no limit on just how far this team can go. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode. I know you had to wait quite a while for it, and it was certainly one of my longest shows to date, but this one was really difficult to do, so I wanted to make sure it was as thorough as possible. Obviously, not every show is going to be this long, especially during the season when we're kind of on those seven-day turnarounds, but in the middle of the off-season, I've got a little bit more leeway, so I wanted to take the extra week and make this one really, truly special. And speaking of the off-season, we are almost done with it. Camps are starting up in a few weeks, which means fantasy football is likewise around the corner. I will have my first preliminary fantasy rankings coming out this Friday for all my Patreon supporters. It does not matter how much you give as a patron. It can be $10 or $5 or even just $1, whatever you can afford to help keep this channel going. Any amount will get access to those fantasy rankings. And of course, I will be updating them regularly as I get more tape study in and as we inevitably sustain some injuries in camp and preseason. So check back every week or two to see those fresh rankings. I'll also have a patron-only Q&A session coming up in just over a week. And then starting in the regular season, I'll have my weekly game picks against the spread also on my Patreon. So I've got a lot more content coming your way. Uh, I may or may not have a full film room episode posted next week because I'm working on a huge fantasy football related project that launches in August, uh, the first week of August to be specific. But trust me, the overall number of videos you guys are about to get is going to be huge. I think you're going to like it a lot. So make sure to check back for that series when that launches. And I'll be back soon-ish with another episode. So until then, later. Later.